All right, everybody, welcome to another Thursday night in the middle of the apocalypse. <laughs> it's real monsters, and we're going to talk about bad shit that's happened in the past, <laughs> not the present. Absolutely. Of course, why not? Right. I'm, the, I'm your host, S.K. Barrett, joining me, as always, the lovely and talented Wes Hobrick. Hello, hello, hello. And they from, always, uh, what's that? Oh, I was just going to say from the one COVID-19 county of Adams in Illinois. You have we got one our case? first case announced yeah. today. Slackers. So I'm in King County, Washington. We've had a lot. That's what I heard. Yeah. And in joining me, me, us, joining us tonight is the... Always resourceful and researchful historian Kelly Evans. Hello, how's it going? I think we're. Uh, I think we've got one case up where I am right now. Yeah, but with, uh, but there's no toilet paper. There is literally no toilet paper. It, it's it me continues nuts. to baffle, and nobody yeah. apparently is actually doing this. <laughs> I mean, if you go by social media, nobody's the one that's actually out there <laughs> buying up all the all the paper. But I live in Canada. We have more trees than anywhere else on the planet. We have more pulp and paper factories than anywhere on the planet. Why can I not get a six-pack of toilet paper? <laughs> exactly. <Fun. laughs> anyway. Yeah, that's the thing about economics. Sometimes it takes a little bit of time to adjust the demand and supply. Yeah, that's true. Very right. true. Well, hey, we've got our beer companies up here now making hand sanitizer, so that's kind of awesome. Yeah, there was um, a few that I saw in Europe doing that, too. And then we have one in St. Louis, about two hours south of here, um, called Four Hands Brewery that is doing that as well. That's kind of cool. Yeah, that's our premier's cool. got in touch with all our little microbreweries. He's also got in touch with General Electric, and they're actually hiring more people because they're making uh, respirator parts. So, yeah, it's all oh. kind of yeah, we're all kind of pulling together up here. Yeah, I think excellent. I think that uh, the moonshiners are why West Virginia only has one case. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it very well could be. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's kind of interesting to look at some of the effects this is having on um, criminal justice too. Where uh, Philly was the first that I saw, the first city that I saw that was telling its officers, we're not going to arrest for low-level offenses to uh, keep crowding out yeah. of the jails. That's a slippery slope. San, yeah. Francisco, San Francisco's a nightmare right now for business owners. Yeah, I mean, I agree. They should still be arresting for things like theft. But they're also not arresting for things like uh, drug possession or prostitution, which is a good yeah, thing. Yeah, that's all right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's, it's a dual-edged sword, though, as you were saying. Definitely. So do we have some history today? Oh, that's actually all I was going to talk about. Okay. Well, saying let's... the whole news cycle has been kind of dominated by this whole freaking virus thing, but <laughs> I've been doing, 
I've been doing my best to keep a watch on the local crime beats too on our Facebook page, facebook.com slash real monsters podcast. If you haven't been there. Yeah, go there, read that stuff. Wes puts out some good articles too. And the, okay. yeah, um, amazing. good, good stuff. Thank you. He is the man with the the crime library that I I would kill for. I would well nearly. <laughs> well, then you'd be in the library, wouldn't you? <laughs> <laughs> well, and that's one um, central source that I did was that I utilized for the research tonight was the uh, book "Murder in All Ages" by Matthew Pinkerton. We put a picture of it up on the Facebook page. Um, so pick that book. So yeah. this is a yeah. this is one of the Pinker you know the detective Pinkertons. Yeah, this is Matthew ones that chased, Pinkerton. The ones that chased yeah. uh, Butch and Sundance all over creation. I want to say he was this. I want to say Matthew was the second generation. Okay, but still Pinkerton. that family. Yeah, yeah, he was the head of the agency though when he wrote this book. Um. So, yeah, he published it two years after the uh, case that we will be looking at tonight happened and signed it in 1914. So I see no reason to doubt a lot of what he has said in here about this case, too. Um, Okay. Did you hear that? Just in case you missed that, he signed it. It's a signed edition. Yes. (laughs) From from what year? (laughs) From what year? Feb- February 22nd, 1914 is when he signed it. Wow. But 1898 is when it was published. I covet that book. <laughs> Sorry. It's in remarkable condition, too. But, yeah, we're not here to yeah. talk about <laughs> you got, you've got a You've got a hell of a collection going. Mm-hmm. I'm working on it. Uh, All right. Who is Pearl Bryan and why do we care? You know, the most interesting thing that I think is the ultimate takeaway, she's kind of a case study in how things like fairy tales and murder ballads start. Yeah. Um, hmm. When you look at it. Okay. It's but, also interesting. It also interesting to me for this one. This seems to be one of the first examples of actual, like, selling souvenirs related to a horrific murder. Yeah, really? it's one of the first examples that I've. I, I, I might not be the first, but it's one of the very early examples of actual souvenirs being sold. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they uh, did that shortly after the crime. In it, was it on the Cincinnati side or the uh, Kentucky side? I can't uh, remember. Where it was, uh, it was the Cincinnati side where they they eventually got. We're getting at the head of ourselves, but where they actually the, the bad guys got hanged and people were selling things there as well as, you know, picking up bits of the dirt and picking up bits of the, the trees in the area and wow. just, just weird. Mm-hmm. Just... Yep. The gravel and everything. Yeah. Uh, yeah. All right. But so let's, let's take it back you, to the beginning. Yeah. Did you guys happen to grab some pictures of the geography? I got I was going to do that. I got a, I got okay. a map of between the two cities. Okay. Why don't we um, bring that up to start? Because we're actually looking at this from the perspective of three different states, um, Indiana, Ohio, and Kentucky. And I don't know if you guys or anybody listening has ever been to southern Indiana, but it's downright ghostly when you drive through it. (laughs) I have. I mean, oh, well, you're the one. (laughs) <laughs> but, I mean, you drive through it, there's all these rolling hills and all these towns that seem to have nobody in them. And it just has a really weird um, sense about it. Kind of, it, like I said, ghostly, I think it's the best word for it. But yeah, you're looking at um, Greencastle is where Pearl was from. She was the youngest of 12 children 12? in a... Uh, Yeah, 12, but only seven were still surviving when um, she was murdered. 
but she was the youngest of 12 in a prosperous farming family in Greencastle. And uh, what year are we talking about here? She was born in 1874. She graduated high school in 1892 out of Greencastle High. She was kind of known as the uh, popular girl. Okay. A lot of men coveted her. But from what Pinkerton was saying, the family knew of no suitor. That her family and her friends didn't know that she was you know, seeing anybody well, at she, the time of her murder. Well, remember at the time she was very, she was very she was rich. She was considered rich at the time, so she she traveled in like like the upper echelons of society, and mm -hmm. she probably would have been expected to have some sort of. Um, prosperous match like she would have been expected to oh, yeah. you know be, become you know manage her own sort of like area and marry someone well to do that sort of thing so it, it's not really surprising that she was maybe sneaking around a little bit her mom and dad might not have known about it yeah <laughs> like they yeah had, definitely yeah they had expectations of, of like a daughter would that family would have expectations of a daughter back then especially um in the higher social yeah. circles yeah and now on February 1st, 1896, when Pearl was 22, a uh, African-American youth who was walking to work at the time at about 8 o'clock in the morning on February 1st, his name was John Helling, he's the son of a neighboring farmer, was walking through the field of farmer John Locke in um, Fort Thomas, Kentucky, which is right across the Ohio River from Cincinnati and he stumbles upon what turns out to be a decapitated female body oh and um, from what Pinkerton says the boy ran and he alerted a, uh, another farmer who in turn alerted the police now where Pearl's body was found they, they didn't know it was Pearl when they found her, obviously, yeah. they didn't have fingerprint technology back then. They didn't have, you know, modern forensics. Um, or a head. But, or a head. Correct, correct. But, um, yeah, they found her, and their first thoughts on this was that it was a soldier who had done this to a prostitute. Because there was a... Uh, Hang on, take take a step back and just just the severity of the crime the severity of the, like the body without the head the, the headlessness really 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 upset people like yeah. we're kind of immune to it now and i hate to say that i hate to use that word but there we've seen so much since you know in the 100 years or so years since she was killed but yeah. the head the, the body with the head removed was profoundly um, disturbing to people at the time it was it I mean, that's a great point and yeah. The crime scene was horribly bloody. It was actually the uh, blood spatter pattern on the surrounding leaves wow. was how they knew that she was alive mm. when they decapitated her. Um, her blood was pumping, but yeah, I, that really shook the conscience of people. Yeah. And I, I think it's also part of what kind of made this the almost crime of the century. I mean, you had some newspapers who were labeling it that in um, competition sort of with Lizzie Borden, which happened, what, four years before that? Yeah. Um, but yeah, the, he uh, stumbled upon the body of this woman and just basically her underwear and without a head, blood yeah. everywhere. She had a. I actually read that she had a dress on, but it wasn't the type of dress you'd expect a, a like a rich woman to be wearing. It was actually kind of a, a not a very nice dress, actually. A uh, cheap. I uh, have to look at the. <laughs> so I'm flipping through the book. By as not we speak a nice here. dress, you mean like, uh, like cheap, no, low quality. It was a low quality dress. It wasn't something you'd expect someone of her um, of her okay. social circle to be wearing. Yeah. Yeah, I was just looking through the book to see what uh, Pinkerton had said about that. Maybe I'll find it here. But, um, yeah, so they find this body, and the first thought 
when they start the investigation is that it was a soldier who did this to a prostitute. Yeah. Why? Partly because Why? Of, there was a nearby garrison, a uh, all on African American garrison of oh. troops oh. that was oh. nearby in the area. And because said, also her clothes weren't that spectacular, so they thought she was more common. Mm-hmm. Would have been an easier scapegoat for him, too, if they hadn't found the culprits rather quick. Yeah. I think as well. But, yeah, I mean, they definitely, Pinkerton said, removed the head to prevent identification. Yeah. But. <laughs> but. But. They left certain articles of her clothing laying nearby. Okay. That they didn't um, think about could be searched for a maker's mark. Well, it was actually very clever how they found out. Let's be honest. Someone did some digging and actually it was actually, I thought it was actually very clever. Oh, yeah? Tell us. Uh, what do you want? No, go ahead, Wes. Oh, I... They were digging. They found some um, gloves of hers. I think a, a tissue, and then her shoes. Yeah. And the shoes bore a uh, manufacturer's number. Like a serial number. Ultimately... Yeah, sort of, but it was traced back to a oh, uh, oh, company oh. called. I'm sorry. So yeah. it was is a a number for the company, not for the shoes. Yeah. Right for gotcha. the company, and yeah, sort of like that. Yeah, I would I would liken it more to a uh, maker's mark. Gotcha. That they would put on yeah. something. Um, they traced it back to Greencastle, Indiana, to a uh, shoemaker by the name of Lewis and Hayes, who um, confirmed that be, with the size, it was a size three, very very small. Oh, that is uh, tiny. I mean, they confirmed rather quickly that, yeah, that's the only pair we sold, and we sold it to a Pearl Bryan of well, the actually, uh, A.S. Bryan family. It's a tiny oh. bit more complicated than that. There's actually, um, there were actually 12 pairs made of that specific shoe, and they tracked down the, um, the, the, the merchant who... Um, sold the shoe that like the the salesman and right. they went through all he hadn't sold all 12 pairs um he had only sold eight of the 12 pairs so they traced all of the buyers of every single one of the pairs found the first eight the owner of the ninth pair was pearl bryant and that's when they realized that they were her shoes oh. she had uh bought them in september of the year before yeah if i'm not mistaken but um yeah, they did that, and uh, they also, ultimately, after finding this bit of information out, got her family to um, look at the other articles of clothing that they found, and they also confirmed yeah. that, yeah, that belongs to my daughter. But I just think it's fascinating, the, the logic they went through. They did the shoes, they went to everybody. It's almost like a modern CSI episode. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, that's, that is kind of out of character for how you how one might view uh law enforcement of the day yeah that's why i was impressed by this it just seems like they were so methodical whoever was um running this like it says um detectives um mcdermott and sheriff Plummer um went and had all the shoes and they they went and talked to everybody but man these guys were on the ball yeah they, uh so many cases, Definitely so were. many cases from that time period. The the police are like, well, if they can't turn in a circle and see who did it, they're like stumped. Mm. And I, it, yet these guys really hustled, really worked. They hard. did. They did. It. Pinkerton said that this is an often uh, made mistake that he had seen in the field too, and he and What's his that? detectives. Not um, not taking into account the clothing. Oh, oh. If they decapitate a corpse. So, um, so I guess yeah. we're going to put it into context around this time. We're, we're finally stepping into, I guess, what we're sort of recognizing as modern forensics, i.e. we're looking at the clothes. We're looking at the area around the body. We're starting to look at things like that now. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. It, to answer Patty's question, although it might be a bit premature, no, they never did find her head. 
No, they even, didn't. Even after offering several big rewards, they did not find her head. Wow. Although we do have theories about where the head is, so we'll probably get to that. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We definitely Looking forward will. to that part. Um, but yeah, they got the uh, family to identify the rest of the clothes. Yeah. And... You know, again, they couldn't name a uh, boyfriend, but she was very attractive to people. Pinkerton called her after identify or after interviewing the family, cold, but would bow to the demands of a superior intellect. Now you have to remember when this book was written. I love that. <laughs> so, but whatever yeah. did they mean by that? <laughs> uh, yeah. Maybe. Well, I mean. Where it makes it sound like they were, you know, fairly straightforward, you know, straight from the hip, shoot from the hip type people, but recognizing that there are people who do these types of things and let them do their jobs. That's what it reads to me. Yes, I would definitely agree with that. Oh, and um, Greencastle, Indiana to Cincinnati, Ohio is 155.6 miles, about two and a half hours today. Yeah, so that, uh, today. Or so on a horse. That That's would be a, a good ride. Yeah, it was several days back then because, of course, they had to take a train or a horse carriage. Right. In this case, Pearl took a train, right. but she had told her parents that she was going to visit her friends in Indianapolis, which was about 112.2 miles away or one hour and 49 minutes in today's. Driving. So is Fort Thomas on the way? Fort Thomas is right across the Ohio River from Cincinnati. Yeah, but she said she was going to Indianapolis, right? Right. That we, That's the opposite direction. It's the opposite from where direction. Cincinnati. That's, what I, that's what I was getting at. Yeah, exactly. So it's not, um, it's not like she was taking this train and got off partway through the journey she went the completely opposite direction of what she told her parents kids. yeah oh kids <laughs> completely opposite and now what pinkerton says with that she went to cincinnati to quote become the subject of cri of a criminal operation and he goes into it with this last paragraph but Though the unfortunate girl's relatives and friends were blissfully ignorant of her wrongdoing, the Cincinnati authorities were not. A.W. Early, A.W. Early, well, her wrongdoing, her messing around yeah, yeah, with yeah. boys, her sex life. <clears throat> A, the, the, AW, the cops in Cincinnati knew? Yeah, getting to that. A.W. Early, a telegraph operator at Greencastle, sent the detectives the following information. He had a friend in Greencastle, a young man named William T. Wood, the son of a prominent Methodist clergyman. This Will Wood had told Early that he had received letters from Scott Jackson, a dental student of Cincinnati, touching the condition of Pearl Bryant, that she was pregnant. Wood said it was necessary in order to preserve Pearl's reputation for her to go to Cincinnati, where Jackson would have a friend, a surgeon, and chemist to take care of her. Okay, I think we should take a step back and kind of, we jumped ahead to, yeah, she's pregnant and now she's going someplace to have something done, but how did the poor girl get into this condition? Right. That is really a question that was never answered. Well, there is a theory. Th I mean, when we when we talk about Scott Jackson, um, we know he was in the area. We know he had a bit of trouble before. He he was embezzling from the college. He was in dental school at the time. We know he um, was introduced to Pearl through her cousin, um, and we know they formed a very very close relationship. And we know she was pregnant at the end of the summer, um, and it was supposedly to Scott where she was going, he tried to convince her to have an abortion a number of times. He kept sending her letters saying, this is how you should do it. And she didn't do any of them, but she wrote back to him saying, well, I tried them all, none of them worked. 
So finally he said, meet me here. So she took the train, not telling her family, and she thought he was going to marry her. But that's not what happened at all. So that's the like the prevailing theory that um, that Scott um, yeah. Jackson was the father of the. She was five months pregnant when she was killed. Yeah, I mean we know she was five months along, but there's also a theory after the. Uh, this is jumping way ahead though. Mm -hmm. After the testimony at the separate trials of Walling and Jackson, that Will Wood got her pregnant. Apparently, he had bragged to his friends, and his friends swore to this under oath at a murder trial. Uh, so yeah, but was her <laughs> bragging doesn't count, especially if she's a, you know, a, pardon my term, monology, but a high value female, right? High class, wealthy, popular. You know, some well, guys. She was some also guy his second cousin. Some guys are going to brag. Well, she was also his second cousin with all of oh. that. I but mean, the, there's, the there's way, no way to know. But the evidence is more heavily weighed on Scott doing it because they had employees say they saw Scott um, with Pearl and Scott's roommate Alonzo eating lunch together. Um, you know, so they were they were together at the same time on January 30th before just, you know, like a day before her death. So, it's... Oh, there's no doubt of his guilt. Oh, okay. Along with the roommate. Oh, and so but you're thinking about the pregnancy. I, I'm just saying with the pregnancy and then the, uh, the re the motive right. that Scott Jackson and Alonzo Walling would have had to kill her. Right. I think that there's real questions around both of those. If you look at it. But, but apparently Scott wrote letters to William with messages for Pearl about this is how you are supposed to, you know, induce a miscarriage. So wouldn't that suggest he was the father? Well, it, that only goes on, on the word of Will Wood. Right. OK. I mean, he burnt all those letters. Yeah. In well, fact, we that's... have a. Uh, Pinkerton published a few of them, what they um, went on was just what he said he could recall. Right. So uh, there is that real that, question and that's, there. That kind, of, that kind of shit wouldn't even be led into a court today. No. 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 Okay, so we have two suspects for the, for the father. So we have Scott and we have her cousin William. But ultimately what happens is she goes to meet Scott on, I don't know if she's deluded, she thinks he's going to marry her for some reason, regardless of who the father is. She ends up with Scott, his roommate, Alonzo, who is also in dental college with them. Um, and they're there together and they're seen together on the day before she dies. Right, right. And I think that we should also be stressing that dentists back then practiced on cadavers. Yes, they did. So. And they, they needed cadavers to practice on. So, yeah, keep that oh, in mind, yeah. kids. What else, what else are you going to do? How else are you going to right. practice, Right, right. The people nowadays don't seem to get that. They were basically, you know, a, a half doctor back then. I mean, they practiced the way most any physician would well, to we'll uh, learn them, all that. We'll call them a doctor as much as they could be a doctor knowing what they did. So, you right. know, medicine right. is everybody's a doctor at the certain age that they're in at that point. Right. But... Yeah, they um, found her. They, I forgot they, where they, I was now. They, 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 yeah, you were jumping ahead to one of the theories about the head, is that, yeah, they absolutely practiced, and just that time, absolutely practiced on cadavers. Oh, mm -hmm. I see where and you're going right And they were always looking out for, like, fresh cadavers to test on. So, yeah, just like I said, kids, keep that in mind. Yeah, and it was they were not always acquired legally. And in yeah, fact, that's, that's we did the show, show about <laughs> Mr. Holmes, who had a thriving yeah. business in cadavers and skeletons. That's well, the okay. Burke's bodies, too. Well, that practice goes back centuries or, you know, so probably thousands of years. So maybe you should do another show just on that. Body snatch. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Michelangelo Burke's was bodies. one. By the way. Sorry? Michelangelo was a, he, he was a bit of a, yeah, he, he studied anatomy 
from corpses in order yeah. to learn how to paint the way he did. And he really did and um, the right. detailed drawings of veins. He really did dissect those things. So, yeah. yeah. And let but, me tell you, uh, the Catholic Church at the time was not happy about it, but that's, like I said, that's another show. Yep. Cadavers, c corpses, <laughs> body snatchers. That's a That would be a good show. Yeah. And now, according to Pinkerton, to get back on track there, Fine. they dispatched <laughs> two detectives to Greencastle. And they, uh, in turn, also notified the uh, Cincinnati police. And Jackson was arrested on February 5th, four days after they ID'd the clothing. And what he says in there was that Jackson, quote, talked quite freely and ign indignantly asserting his innocence. Um, and he said, this is when they got on the trail of his roommate. He said to fetch his roommate, Alonzo Walling, a, yeah. a med student. But um, at this first point in time with that, Walling was questioned and actually released. But at the same time, a reporter working in Cincinnati was apparently pretty diligent on the case, and he swore out an affidavit that they based a warrant on, and they re-arrested Walling. Oh. That, that was over the next, literally, the next three hours from when they released him to when they picked him back up, that that happened. Man, that's almost cruel. I mean, granted, he's a scumbag murderer, but... To to think you they think you think you got away with it and they let you go and then you're like woohoo and then snatched you back up and you're back in jail. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, there's questions as to the degree of Walling's guilt in all this, but um, at any rate, on February the sixth, they picked up Will Wood in South Bend, Indiana, which is about 279 miles north of um, Greencastle, or about four hours, 36 minutes today's driving. And he, in turn, admitted that he sent Pearl to Cincinnati, but he did not know that she was going to be murdered. And he was ultimately, I found this very interesting. Would was ultimately released on five thousand dollars bail, That's five grand in in eighteen ninety six. Yeah, yeah, yeah but money. he also agreed to testify against the other two, so he kind of cut a deal. And he did, but he also served some time after that, and I'm not sure uh, why. But if you look at that five thousand dollars in twenty twenty money. That's one hundred and fifty-three thousand nine hundred and seventy-five dollars, calculating the, inflation. The weird thing about Wood is, okay, so supposedly his family he comes from an upper-class family. Um, Pearl is a lovely girl, but and Wood is the one who introduces, um, uh, oh God, his name's just gone right out of my head now. Um, Scott Jackson. to to Pearl. He must have known that Scott had had some previous, um, you know, dealings with the law. The yeah, but, of his previous college. So it, you got to wonder about the the crowd he ran around with. He also had a uh, disorderly conduct arrest with a yeah. prostitute yeah. in yeah. Cincinnati. You got to wonder either why is this guy introducing these people who he probably knows are not very nice to his lovely cousin, or like what is going on there? <laughs> well, yeah, it's uh, it's a small town though, right? I mean, a really small town. Yeah, but still, I, I don't know. I just, I just, I don't, just, I, I just find I, it interesting. I, just, I'm just throwing it out there as a, hmm, that's interesting. Right. Uh, I would wonder if you were to assume the hypothesis that Wood was having sex with her was correct, whether there wasn't a little bit of coercion involved. Granted, there wasn't the uh, same stigma with that degree of, I don't know if you call it incest or just cousin fucking. So you reckon, back then. so you maybe he, you reckon he got her pregnant and then because he was friends with, um, 
uh, Scott and Alonzo, who were was kind of part of the medical community, he sought their help in taking care of the situation? It very well may be. Could be. I mean, mm-hmm. that's one theory of what ultimately happened. Because apparently... But- Last things that anybody heard her said when heard her say when they actually met was, um, "I'm going back to my home, and Scott Jackson, you'll have to answer to my brother Fred for this." So now, whether that means I'm you got me pregnant and you're now not marrying me, or I don't know, like that's apparently that's the last words that anybody ever heard her speak. Hmm. I'm going back to my home, and Scott Jackson, you will have to answer to my brother Fred for this. Yeah. So she names and, and him. Was that in? Um... Fort Thomas, or was that before the trip? No, that, that would have been in Cincinnati. in Cincinnati. Yeah, that was after she took the train and met them, um, and she met them in the park. And Scott met, told Pearl, Pearl, Pearl come and meet me, and he um, he brought Alonzo to his roommate along. But um, yeah, I, mean, I was just looking again here. I'm losing where I was at in my notes with all of this. So we're jumping around. Sorry, yeah, sorry about that. That happens on this show, doesn't it? It does. <laughs> but, um, yeah, Pinkerton described Wood as being kind of weak-willed, though. And he fell prey to the stronger will of Scott Jackson, is what he says. Um, but, yeah, another interesting thing there. Uh, Jackson and Walling were identified by a waiter in Cincinnati with a uh, woman fitting the description of Pearl Bryan before she was murdered. Mm. And an interesting thing that he overheard, the waiter overheard, was Jackson saying, quote, I would like to have a woman's head to dissect. Well, that's not creepy at all. No. (laughs) Who doesn't have that conversation over dinner? (laughs) (laughs) Well, um... Yeah, yeah, I could see why that would stick in the mind of a waiter. Yeah, yeah, and it and it wasn't just the waiter either. It was actually the uh, restaurant proprietor backed the waiter up, so wow. apparently he heard it too. Um, and that's just you know one of the witnesses that was going on there. And then ultimately, when they get both of them in jail, one casts blame on the other, and back and forth, and back and forth. Yep. For a while. But nobody points uh, the finger at William. Yeah, which is kind of weird. Yeah. like I don't know where he would have been at, but, you know, 153000 not, not even having any kind of contributing role in this. No, uh, they, they, they just, hadn't. They were just pointing at each other, and he's on the sideline going, hey, hey, hey. Yeah, basically. Kind of. Yeah. Yeah. I I 153,975 bucks is the bail they would set for a very high degree felony today. Yeah. And I know you said that, I know you said that Pinkerton says that he seemed like he was like kind of weak-willed, but that doesn't sound like the actions of a weak-willed person set off, you know, go after the two people that maybe came to you or your friends with, have them go after each other and you step into the background and go, "Oh yeah." Like, that just doesn't sound weak-willed. That sounds cunning. Yeah, and yeah. I mean, maybe he was wrong on that. Mm. <laughs> just sharing his assessment there. Um, well, I don't well, want to I don't want to despair for saying to Pinkerton, so let's move on. It's also, well, no, it's, it's not also about possible that. that everybody seems weak-willed to a Pinkerton. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's true, <laughs> actually. <yeah. laughs> this is true. <laughs> but... Yeah, I mean, the contradictions between the two of them went on for over a year. Um, Walling said that Jackson killed Pearl with an injection of prussic acid or cocaine. He wasn't sure which. What is, I don't know prussic acid. That's a new one to me. That is what was new to me as well. I'd have to look that up, which I didn't yet, but... Um, They did manage to find two-thirds of a grain of cocaine in her stomach. Which I'm not totally sure how that translates in terms of measurement today. But that is what the chemist said that he found. Oh. Okay, 
Prussic acid is hydrogen cyanide. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Apparently, it's hydrogen cyanide. Yeah. <laughs> I just got there, just as you said. That. <laughs> I win. To sodium. It's the precursor to sodium cyanide and potassium cyanide, so that puts it a little bit more into uh, into perspective. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. I hadn't looked that part up. That yeah. Well, that's the stuff you get in cherry, like cherry pits. That's the stuff that kills you if you eat too many cherry pits. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Grapes Ap and uh -huh. yeah, apricot pits. If you eat, if you eat apricot pits and cherry pits, apparently it's it's lethal if you eat yeah. enough of them. Yeah, I didn't realize this is the same stuff. Okay, got it. <laughs> well, interesting. But apparently, also there were some questions about whether um, Walling or Jackson or a third party. And I was just looking for his name was going to perform this abortion that was going on. Um, but before they got there, Pearl gets to Cincinnati. She checks into um, room 114 of the hotel that she is staying in. And Jackson doesn't see her until the next day, as far as we can discern from the timeline of what's happening there. Um, Room 114 of the Indiana House. In Cincinnati. Yes, in okay. Cincinnati, and Jackson doesn't see her till the next day, but I'm just still looking for the name of that doctor and flipping around here. I Yeah, I saw it earlier as well, and I'm trying to find it. But this doctor that they were supposedly going to use, the only reason that he couldn't testify... At the um, yeah. 1896 trials of Jackson and Walling, was that he was locked up in an asylum. The doctor was? Soon after. The doctor was. Like oh, the God. loony asylum, not get well from tuberculosis asylum? Yeah, <laughs> like the loony bit. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, but God. they had a uh, chemist who testified that indeed he had made um, ergot for this doctor around oh. this time. That's oh. terrible. Which I guess they also used ergot for um, blood clotting faster to increase that. But that stuff drives you, I mean, that's, that Literally stuff has been. Literally insane. Yeah. Yeah, that stuff has been I mean, I use it in my book in, in my book takes place in the like the fourteen hundreds. That stuff has been known for like literally centuries as as killing you, driving you insane. The symptoms are crazy. And it's it's uh one theory behind the Salem witch trials. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean apparently that's what they were thinking they were gonna use that for. So just was people, blood clotting. So probably just to give people um an idea of what it is in case like they don't know what ergot poisoning is fungus no. ergot yeah. is a fungus that uh, primarily grows on bread doesn't it grain yeah i thought it, yeah grains as a whole yeah. it grows on rye um less more it's mostly on rye less common on other sorts of re of um of bread so a lot of the poorer people um would use rye to make bread especially back in the like in the oldie days so mm -hmm. there were a instances if this particular mold got on the rye um like if it were particularly wet season then this herb got this mold would grow and it would it would start you would give you hallucinations you would be constantly thirsty you would eventually die from it um it was really really nasty well it, you have to remember i think as well that in 1896 it was kind of the uh wild west as far as pharmaceuticals went yeah. Kinda. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You mean because they put cocaine and heroin into right. cough medicines? Right. I mean, it's before they really knew just how bad these things were, I think. Well, not ergot, but, you know, the social cost. But yeah. that's if you, I mean, if you, if you contract it by accident, like a few people, like people did, like, for example, the Salem witch trials, one of the theories is that, um, the, the rye was, was tainted and they actually, um, were poisoned by it. But medicinally through, through the period, like right through from medieval times, it's actually been used to help women, um, get rid of childbirth. 
or get rid of a baby if they're oh, having a miscarriage. Really? The baby dies. Oh. So it's, actually, it's actually known to um, ex- contract the uterus, expel placenta, et cetera, et cetera. So it's got a long, like, de- you know, centuries long use for that. Uh, or a little so medieval medicine. Interesting. Have me on and not have me throw medieval medicine at you. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> the medi- Fabulous. Fabulous. medieval abortionist tool. Always yeah. interesting yeah. information. And yeah, it was very, very dangerous because it could kill the person who was, who was, you know, the, like so. Presumably, um, the mother had already had the baby. She survived the, the, you know, and you need to get rid of the placenta and a little bit of this ergot, if administered by someone who knows what they're doing, could help with the uterus contracting and getting rid of or expelling the placenta. And this has been known for a long time. But I guess in larger amounts, it, it could expel a fetus. I, I don't know. I never even thought about that. I I honestly I'm not sure of the amount that they got, but I just know that the chemist said that he gave them or well, gave him that, the ergot. Yeah, right? we know she wasn't. We know her heart was still beating when her head was severed, so we know the ergot didn't kill her. Right, okay. and we know that the cocaine was in her system. Right. Um, at that same time, but yeah, I mean, each blamed the other for the decapitation for quite a while. Uh, they ended up finding Alonzo Walling's bloody trousers in a locker at his school. Oh, yeah. for Pete's sakes. I know. And... <laughs> Can I just talk about the idiocy of some of these? I mean, not that I, I'm not a serial killer and I'm not, I just, but come on. If you kill someone, get rid of the clothes. It's rule number one. Burn them. Burn yeah. Them. Yeah. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> in, uh, <laughs> well, don't be sorry. I, Jackson, but, while but they find that, his bloody trousers, they found Jackson's bloody coat fished out of the sewer at the direction of Walling. Well, well that's, that's one <laughs> step better <laughs> than keep... bit of effort. <laughs> I'm sorry yeah. I stepped on you. What, I missed what you said, Kelly. Sorry, I said at least he put a little bit of effort in. He put it in the sewer. Yes, exactly. Yeah. It didn't just leave it in his goddamn locker at school. <laughs> yeah. yeah that's just lazy yeah i mean it it's just weird but and, you know i think that's part of what kept um people interested and people um following all of this was that these guys they're both kind of serial liars but there's a grain of truth to a little bit of what they say like Walling pointing out, hey, you can fish out Scott's bloody uh, coat from such and such sewer yeah. in Cincinnati. Um, and they ultimately also found in that coat six of Pearl's handkerchiefs. Oh, in, <laughs> so, in, the, in, the, in Jackson's coat that they, that they found in the sewer? Yes. Huh. Okay, my yeah. first question should be... How is it still in the sewer? Or, well, yeah, it should be something like that. But my first question is actually, why was she carrying six handkerchiefs? Uh, good question. Sorry, how long was she going to be gone? Uh, yeah, I was just wondering about that. Anyway, anyway, sorry. Um, my understanding, it was about a uh, five-day trip by train. Oh, okay. So yeah, you, why would maybe you, that why would, would answer it. Why would... So uh, presumably they were monogrammed. Yes. So, it's probably the equivalent of I order six packs of Kleenex all the time because my nose has been running since 1984. So she probably just had needed the handkerchiefs. I get it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And he took them. Oh, he took them away from the crime scene so they wouldn't connect her to, you know, the the handkerchiefs yeah. to the to the right. victim. Been but. Yeah. Yet he mm-hmm. lumped him in his coat and threw the coat in the sewer, which apparently didn't go very far because they were <laughs> weeks later able to go in and find it. Well, it, yeah, you have that. And then you have him um, saying something a couple of days after the crime to the degree of um, I want to butcher a woman and deposit her uh remains in the outhouses of Cincinnati or excuse me before the crime he said that oh it was when he 
it was something he said when he was drunk. And he also actually had a uh, quote about, I'm going to kill Pearl and the baby when he was drunk, allegedly, again. So, you know, evidence pointing both ways. These serial killers, man. Like, when I get drunk, I'd like, you know, oh, I love you. You're my best friend. Right? These guys, I want, to, I want to cut up people and put them in outhouses all around the town. Like, come on. <laughs> well, uh, see, here's the thing is that uh, it seems that alcohol is a filter remover. And the things that you want to say come out. Yeah. Yeah, I've heard that. And I've been in the alcohol business for 33 years now. Our family has. And I'm a firm believer that alcohol has a tendency to bring out the person you really are when you're drunk. Well, funny you should say that because I never do this show without having a couple of glasses of red wine in front of me. Anyway, if I get really drunk, I write poetry. So, shit. That's not who I am. I have a copy of your book. <laughs> um, anyway, um, back to, do you remember earlier I mentioned that um, the sensationalism of this um, yes. case? It was one of the first examples of like actually, you know, wanting to be there. While all this was going on, only like a day later, um, people from the area were flocking to the scene where the body was found because, I mean, if they had phones, they would probably take pictures of it, but they just wanted to be there. They wanted to see a dead body. They just... Yeah. Every like the police had to actually try and keep them away because everybody just wanted to go there. People from outside the town came there just to see a dead body. So it was quite a, a shocking, yeah, after, like an after effect of this as well. Well, yeah, and they had no comprehension of the uh, need to secure a right. crime scene back right. then either. So, yeah, that would be another big reason. But, um, well, you know, you, you saw there's a lot of uh, photographs of uh, dead outlaws, for example. People were drawn to those corpses as well. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. I was actually wondering, this is around the time um, of also sort of newspaper sensationalism. So there's got to be an element of that. Mm-hmm. People are reading the newspaper, seeing, oh, a headless body was found. Hey, I've got to go see that. Mm-hmm. Um, Because I read through some of the headlines from the time of some of the local newspapers, and they're just headless body found in four. You know, like they just they they really didn't hold anything back. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, that was Uh, kind of. uh, I mean, they were. It wasn't just news; it was also a primary source of entertainment for people. Yeah. Mm Hmm. Very social back then. This was pre-radio. Yeah. Yep, but so a day or two after the murder, Jackson was apparently carrying Pearl's small travel bag. Uh, Pinkerton called it a uh, valise. Is that how you say that? V-A-L-I-S-E? Valise? Valise. Valise. Jackson was spotted carrying that into a uh, local tavern in Cincinnati. And he sets it down, and the barkeep is there, and apparently the barkeep picked it up and said, that's heavy, what do you got in there, a bowling ball? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) But this is after, so so this came out, like he admitted to this after he first said that they had thrown it into the river. Yeah, well, yeah, that was one of the... One of the versions. He ended up dragging the river for, like, what, two days or something, looking for this head? Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, and no luck with that. Yeah. That's actually, um, when they started to think that this crime was totally solved, Pinkerton points out, um, Lulu May Hollingsworth of Knox City, Indiana, about 226 and a half miles and four hours in today's driving to the north of Cincinnati appeared on the scene. And she claimed to have a letter from Scott Jackson saying where Pearl lost her head. And that is partly where the river thing started. Because in this letter, 
it said that Pearl died in um, Jackson's room, but then Jackson hired a guy to take her body to the thicket near Fort Thomas where he was waiting. And then he paid the same guy to to decapitate her and toss the head over a suspension bridge into the Ohio River. But the forensics don't hold that up because you know right. we know her heart was still beating when her heart when her head was cut off. Right. She was killed on the spot. Right. And that's where I think they uh, received that letter before the coroner's inquest. Right. Because it took that to establish that her uh, that she was still alive when they decapitated her. So does does something like that invalidate the entire statement? or just one aspect of it? Well, police initially believed this woman. Right. But then after investigating it, they came to the conclusion that she's mentally unsound and that friends of Jackson and Walling had gotten her to write the letter. Right. Uh, Which it... Because there's always just those people that, that, you know, they're more important than the investigation. Right. Mm hmm. Well, and that's interesting you would say that, Kelly, because there is also this is also a very early example of murder groupies. Right. They had a Jackson and Walling had a lot of women who would visit them in that jail in Ohio initially before they moved them. It was just because, you know, they were two dashing young men. Right. Arrested. But, um, I saw their pictures. Uh, does that count as dashing? Apparently, <laughs> they thought it did. Okay. <laughs> and they thought it did at the time, so. Yeah, um, let's see. Yeah, they were initially to be charged in Ohio, but they were willingly surrendered to Jackson County, Kentucky, and that is uh, Newport, Kentucky, more or less uh, 1.9 miles from Cincinnati across the Ohio River. And they were not liking that because the security at the uh, jail there was very subpar and... There was a rumor that the uh, Bryans and friends and family were forming a lynch mob to literally drag these guys out and hang them before a trial had happened. Yeah, that was a real thing. That's a real thing. <laughs> uh, it really, it, it's not just in the movies, guys. People, uh, vigilante mobs would attack a jail and take people out and string them up. If they were yeah. riled up enough and drunk enough. Did you yeah. know the when there was a jailbreak and they actually stayed in prison because they were terrified? Yeah. Oh, I hadn't gotten no. to that part yet. So, okay. We were actually jumping ahead, too, because <laughs> with what you said, SK, about the, um, a part of that being true, Yeah. that there actually might be a bit of it being true when you get to... A guy named George Jackson, no relation to Scott Jackson. Um, and I was just looking for the part in the book because Pinkerton puts it pretty well. And he recounts this guy's testimony verbatim. On the afternoon of February 15th, George H. Jackson, private coachman for Major um, Vidikand, on McGregor Avenue, Mount Auburn, called to police officer Ed Swain, who was passing where he was at work, and asked if the missing head of Pearl Bryan had been found. Informed that it had not been found, he asked if they discovered the coachman and was told no. Then he fairly startled the officers by asking him this question. If they should find the coachman, would he be held for the crime along with the murderers? Ooh. Swain diplomatically replied that he thought not, though this would, of course, depend upon the part the driver of the vehicle had played in the tragedy. 
And getting to the guy's story, jumping ahead a couple of paragraphs, he was a, uh, George Jackson was a drill master and commander of the Caldwell, Caldwell Guards okay. and a colored military organization of Cincinnati. Not my verbiage there, Pinkerton's verbiage. Yeah. Um, on the night of January 31st, he was engaged in drilling the company until midnight. And after dismissing the guards, he was standing with others on the corner of George and Elm Streets in the, quote, Tenderloin District, when a tall, dark-haired man wearing a corduroy cap came up and said, do any of you fellows want to make $5 by driving a carriage tonight? This was exactly in the drill master's line, and he was promptly accepted the offer. In a few minutes, a square box surrey, a carriage drawn by a gray horse, was driven up and Jackson mounted the driver's box, George Jackson, the uh, dark man taking his seat beside him. He was told that there was a doctor and a sick woman in the surrey who were then taken to Newport, Kentucky. The man with the corduroy cap directed him where to drive, and they crossed the bridge over the Ohio River and entered Newport. George Jackson could not see the occupant of the carriage by reason of a drawn curtain, but he heard the voice of a man proceed from the vehicle and what he described as a, quote, funny noise made by a woman. After driving through the streets of Newport, Jackson became badly frightened and made an effort to jump from the box, but the man beside him placed a revolver to his head and said, you, drive that horse or I'll make an end of you very quickly. Hmm. Um, the man took his name and asked him many questions about himself, telling him afterwards that if he said a word to anyone about the transactions of the night, he would kill him, and added, quote, if we get into any trouble, we have friends on the outside who will follow you up and kill you. Um, this badly frightened Jackson. After the arrest of the two murderers, he constantly imagined that he was being followed, and fear kept him from disclosing what had occurred to the authorities. Until then. Wow. That's a hell of a story. Yeah. Um, okay. Let me just throw in that his story was later, he kind of, um, he came forward, he was actually convicted of perjury in another trial after that, um, and he actually, um, when he went to identify, um, like, the suspect, he couldn't, so I would, he, like, he was kind of a, cra uh, like, a, a known con man to them, and he kind of craved notoriety, notoriety, so... Mm -hmm. Um, like when he was taken to prison, to, for example, to identify Scott Jackson, he didn't recognize anyone until a guard happened to mention, oh, that's, you know, Jackson's name, at which point he said, oh, yeah, that's him. Um, that's uh, that's not totally correct, though, because he did instantly identify Alonzo Walling. OK. Who was taller than Scott Jackson. Right. So if you believe the uh, story about it being dark when they did all this it would make sense that he couldn't yeah. ID Scott Jackson. So, I guess by today's standards, he, he was a known, like he was known. So you probably wouldn't have right. actually taken his uh, testimony yeah. to consideration. Well, and I mean, the perjury conviction happened after all this too. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah, but it does go to character as the lawyers like to say. It just also says um, this or one other article I found that says that later the police chief and his former employee in Springfield publicly stated that they um, believed he was lying. Well, and you also had a few of his troops that he was drilling uh, said that he was there till 2 a.m. Right. Oh. So. Anyway, there's there's suspicion on just about every aspect of this. Right. But. <laughs> Another interesting bit with that, when they found Jackson's coat in that sewer, they found a bit of the uh, railroad, the railroad where he hitched the buggy when they were doing all that. They mm -hmm. found a bit of it wrapped with his coat in the sewer hmm. as well. Oh, like a railroad tie? Yeah. 
And how would they know? How would they know which piece of real? Oh, hold on, I was looking. <laughs> I was looking for that because there was a way that they could identify. And why would he keep it? What it was? That's a good question. Because I mean, a piece of railroad tie is, you know, a stick. Really, it's a, just a chunk of wood. You could toss it alongside any road, and nobody would give it any mind. Yeah. Uh, I was just looking for that. They said it was, um, they were sure that it was the same thing that they uh, had hitched the horse to. So whatever component that was. What what would you hitch? Unless it was a bridge? I, what, there's nothing railroad I mean, it, that you would It was a thicket. <laughs> I mean, it was a thicket with train tracks nearby. Um, yeah, but but nothing. Yeah, I you, don't know. You know, ties are obviously on the ground. You wouldn't tie a horse up to that, right? It was some component of the railroad. Yeah, it might not. It likely wasn't a tie, but it was some component oh. that was. They said was near where he hitched the horse. And yeah, why would you? Why would it be in a coat? Yeah. It's weird. So much to write about you guys. You got to get on it. Write a book about the weird stuff that killers have kept for like no random reason, or, for random reasons. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I mean, it definitely wouldn't qual qualify as a trophy because he threw it away. Oh, I yeah, know. It's weird. <laughs> yeah, but it, I mean, it, like you know, we said, the, the piece of the railroad and the handkerchiefs, that neither one of those things make any sense to keep. No. In his coat when you throw it away. No, I mean, they don't at Scatter all. Scatter your evidence, people. Come on. Okay, so we agree that he should have probably burned the coat and burned the, the handkerchiefs. Right. But yeah. We understand, okay, he took the handkerchiefs because she could be identified because they were probably monogrammed. But a piece of railroad, like, why would you even pick that up? Why? Yeah. It, it's a good question. I don't know. I can understand in today's day and age if maybe you got your own blood on it, there was a piece, some sort of DNA on it, you had right. to take it away because it, you could be identified by it. But back then, why? So was, weird. Was, um, you know, was she killed with it, you know, or knocked unconscious? Did it have her blood and hair on it? Um, maybe. I don't know that. I don't know. It, but we don't know what, we she don't know was what dragging the thing her was. feet. When they got her there, I mean, she could barely walk. If you go by the yeah. uh, beginning of that story, you know, she had lost a lot of blood from them trying to abort with chemicals, and then likely taking a uh, dentist tools after that. I don't know. So, okay, so that's one for your book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, I mean, is, it's, that is one for the book. Just call it why. <laughs> well like we said in the description for this video um what do you think you know <laughs> about yeah. the pearl Bryan murder you know I did, there's I a know lot anything. here i didn't know anything all right so uh, so these guys get convicted right yes in separate trials again um Let's see. Scott Jackson's beginning in Newport on April the 22nd, 1896, and lasting three weeks. I don't have how long um, Walling's trial was, but they were both ultimately hung on March 20th, 1897. It was the last hanging in that county in Kentucky. And if anybody is watching or is listening to this, it is behind the um, YMCA that currently exists there in Fort Thomas is where they were hung. Or excuse me, in Newport. That's one to add to your vacation plans, boys and girls. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean... There's just so much there. And oh, another thing that Jackson allegedly drunkenly told 
people was that if he killed her, he was going to try to make it look like a suicide. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> Oops, I accidentally struck my head? Like, seriously? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it, you know, and I think it, there's no doubt that he and Walling were guilty of murdering her. But again, I think there's a real question as to whose baby that was. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, yeah, we'll never and, know. And what the hell? I think, I think William got away with one. Something. He got away with something. I don't know exactly what. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I mean, that, that's also a hefty bail once you consider that he was also the son of a minister. Yeah, that's true. That's a lot of money. Hey, man, you would... I'm trying to think of a comparable crime that they would set bail at 150 grand for today. Maybe yeah, assault. They, they, yeah, they, it yeah. would have to be pretty bad crime. Yeah. So he was obviously up there in the suspect, suspect list for something. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so... So with regard to the head, we know they searched the river. We know that um, Scott retrieved the bag the next day uh, from the saloon keeper who said that it was heavy and rounded and kind of reminded him of a, of a um, bowling ball. Um, mm-hmm. he, apparently he took, he went back and, and got the, the bag the next day, gave it to a different saloon keeper named um, Mr. Kugel and told him to give it away. Um, this Kugel guy opened it and found it stained with blood. When the trial was underway, um, he recognized what was going on and he brought it to the police chief who showed it to Scott and he said, um, yeah, that's Pearl Bryan's valise. And then they asked him if, if the head had ever been in the valise and he kind of just kind of answered weirdly. He said, I suppose it was, I guess, which is, like, yeah, well, that's an it's odd kind of statement weird response. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Downright bizarre. It was very, yeah, very strange. Um, yeah, another interesting thing that they what? did but early. You know what? I think I think I can tie a couple of things together because of that statement. Okay. Go um, ahead. If if that that makes me think that maybe he had a dissociative uh, episode, and he didn't remember doing all the things, and that might explain why he had some goddamn piece of railroad with him, right? Because. <laughs> He was literally not in his own head. It could be. And so now he's thinking, well, I, you know, it, I suppose the head was in there, but ugh, darn if I can actually remember. Hey, I don't, I don't know about that, but I think there's no doubt that Scott Jackson was a psychopath. Well, do you remember we, we mentioned earlier that um, they were both dental students. They practiced on cadavers. Right. Um, mm-hmm. Actually easy to come by. So the like the likely story is that he probably sold the head to a co- to the college he was going to. He probably sold it to some of his, his um, student mates. Um, either that or he used the giant furnace on the campus. Because once you're done with the cadavers, they generally right. were put into a giant furnace. Um, they weren't actually sent back for burial. So it, the likelihood is they either took it to practice on and then stuck it in the furnace or he just stuck it in the furnace right away. But we really don't know what happened to her head. It's, it's never been solved. Mm-hmm. Like it, like I said earlier, despite cash rewards, it's yeah. never been solved. Um, and now, and this is one that falls totally in the realm of speculation, but this is also where the, uh, the folk tales and the ghost stories come in. Bobby Mackey's Music World in mm-hmm. Wilder, Kentucky. One of the theories is that they threw the head down that well that was in that building. It used to be a slaughterhouse, so they okay. needed that for the uh, blood of the animals. So it wasn't a water well. It was a drainage well. A drainage well. Okay. Yep. Oh, that's that's that. one theory. So yeah, the other theory I'd heard was that um, they... <laughs> Her head was used to worship the devil in the place where Bobby Mackey's is. So there might still be a well there, but they also used the head to, for some sort of weird devil worship, which I don't think anybody really believes. But apparently, um, I, I found damn, I found a sign. If you actually go to Bobby Mackey's, 
Um, there's a sign on the door that says, warning to our patrons, this establishment is purported to be haunted. Management is not responsible and cannot be held liable for any actions of any spirits or ghosts on the premises. <laughs> That's the sign as you walk uh, in. <laughs> interesting. Hey, he's a Bobby Mackey has always been kind of, um, yeah, kind of blowing with the wind on that. You know, he mm -hmm. won't say that he thinks the place is haunted, but he won't say it's not haunted. It's probably good either. for business. Well, the yeah, thing, exactly. The shop and coming up with like people have people that have gone to the shop have said they've seen Pearl's ghost, they've seen Alonzo Walling's ghost, they've seen you know Scott Jackson's ghost. Um, a newspaper reported Walling just before the noose was slipped around his neck. Apparently, he said he was going to return and haunt the area. Um, a lot of people feel that he, you know, followed through on that. Um, apparently, a psychic said she saw Scott Jackson having an argument with Pearl. She saw him yelling at Pearl as she was um, holding her head in her hand, stating, my head, my head. And he yelled at her and said, it was your fault. And so, you know, it's kind of weird. Oh, uh, here's another one. A female employee at the bar. Yeah. says that she walked into the club one day um, and the unplugged, unplugged jukebox started to play the anniversary song. And apparently the jukebox doesn't even have that song on it. She felt that it was Pearl being romantic and loved playing the song. Oh my. So, yeah. Mm. Wow. Apparently several women patrons pregnant at the time they visited the nightclub said that, I don't know what means Pearl messed around with them a little bit. I don't know, maybe she was having some fun. Huh. Uh, well... <laughs> And now I, uh, I just noticed the picture of the tombstones yeah. up on there. The tradition now with that, because vandals have been um, taking chunks of her stone away. They've actually had to replace it at well, least you, once yeah, you that can I see know where of. They've been chipping away at the base. But the uh, tradition now, if you visit the cemetery <laughs> that she's buried in, is to leave uh, Penny heads up. <laughs> clever um in the chat patty says she thinks that um pearl's haunting all these places looking for her head <laughs> i mean yeah, she may a, very well be it's as good a explanation as any i suppose sure yeah and it just goes to show that there's a lot more to what people think was, you know, just a simple story. There's, there's so nothing many nothing simple things. about this story. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, mean it, there have been several folk songs written about it, most of them um, stretching details to be generous yeah. in their lyrics. Well, let's see if we can uh, get this one to play. Now, this is, I don't, I'm going to try it. We'll see if it will come across. It was recorded in 1929, I think. I love this one. Let's see if it comes across. Can't, I don't know if it's. I'm not hearing anything. Okay. I'm honestly not sure because I leave my uh, YouTube on mute during this, so we don't have feedback. I can put the um, I can put the link on the in the chat because it's it's worth listening to. It's kind of an awesome song. Yeah, do that. Yeah, I I liked it when I heard it. Yeah, I'm just hoping I can do it without actually setting it off and just messing things up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it shouldn't be a problem. I, d I honestly do like um, Bobby Mackey's version of Pearl, too. It's country. It's old country. There's a couple of different versions, I noticed. The one that I'm going to post in the chat is actually my favorite. It's kind of the, well, it's like with the 1920s, I think. It's, it's, uh, it's I hate to say it's sweet, but it's, I don't know. It's, there's kind of something, I don't know. Um, Damn, the link won't fit. Sorry, I can't do it. Um, anyway, no, there's, there's some, kind of something sort of sweet and innocent about it, despite the content matter. Yeah, I liked it quite a bit. 
Although I f- maybe it's my modern years, but I found it kind of upbeat for the story it was telling. It was almost uh, a, it was almost like a the story of a, a a a shunned lover instead of a like a brutal murder. It was just weird. Yeah, 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 and it just it goes to show you know again how these folk tales are built when they have me a little bit of truth in them. Yep. So you you kind of live in this kind of region, let's say, Wes. Had, yeah. Had you heard of this case before? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I've I've known about this case for probably at least ten years, if not more. The murder of Pearl Bryan, and. You know, honestly, I think the first time I saw it was when I was watching that um, dumb show, Ghost Adventures. Oh, okay. With somebody. (laughs) That always makes me laugh when they uh, go around and find these little dust particles and say, oh, it's a ghost, it's a ghost. Oh, moats. Oh, God, yeah, (laughs) moats. But I find the... the, um, Tales around it all pretty interesting. You know, some people call Bobby Mackey's a portal to hell because of that. Well, let's see if that, I can. That doesn't draw business to your place. I don't know what would. Well, he did. I also noticed something here when I was talking about the um, the various stories that have come out. Is apparently his wife, I guess, um, claimed that she had been. Um, uh, hang on. She was grabbed around the waist and thrown to the ground by an unseen entity when she was five months pregnant. So it's mm-hmm. not not it's it's more than just he's not denying it. He's like I think he's like pushing it a little bit. Yeah. What it didn't it involve uh, fall down the flight of stairs? Oh wow! No, all I saw was that she was pushed. <laughs> I didn't see her huh. fall down the stairs. I could be wrong about that one. Oh, I know one thing I can put in there because apparently the uh, YouTubes are not fitting. I tried to post Bobby Mackey's version, which is called Poor Pearl, if you want to search it. I just managed to post my version, which is the 1920s version. This uh, from the Project Gutenberg is a uh, title called the... I have to take a look at it. Well, subtitled The Headless Horror, written around that time. The Mysterious Murder of Pearl Bryan or The Headless Horror. Mm. So, yeah, this case has the, the sort of the convergence of or the beginning of a bunch of new stuff. So the, the, the folk songs, the sort of like idealizing a murder. It's got mm-hmm. the, the sensationalism from the newspapers. It's got the very starts of forensic medica- med- um uh, investigation by the sounds of it and it's also got freaky weird people buying souvenirs <laughs> <laughs> yeah kind of a turning point kind of a well like, a watershed I, crime and, yeah and gawking around the the place where the body was found <laughs> yeah mm-hmm. yeah this and uh lizzie borden mm. like we were saying and then, of course, only, um, what was it, 16 years after that, you have Villisca, which we did an episode yeah. on. Yep. Which also is also... In the same region. Yep. Well, also a contender for crime of the century, too, if which you look century? at the headlines. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's easy to call something crime of the century when the century is not even 20 years old. <laughs> yeah. yeah. This is true. It's like those people that come up with movies in January and say, oh, this is the movie of the year. It's like, well, okay. That's well, confident. yeah, you can say, yeah, they say best comedy of the year on January 3rd. <laughs> Not that I want people that, you know, announce that they this is the crime of the century. I don't want people to go, hey, hey hold on to my beer, you know, right. like just, but still, yeah, <laughs> yeah take the point. <laughs> yep. Well, there's a lot of, there's a lot of money. You say crime doesn't pay, but it sure does for newspapers. 
And it does. If it bleeds, it leads. Oh my god, is that a real thing? That's a that's an idiom from uh, journalism, yeah. Yep. I've, I've never heard that. That is awesome. Really? Yeah, I, I wonder when that originated. I'm curious now. Well, I think it's I think it's a actually a TV news idiom that came started oh. I believe in the 70s. Yeah. So by leading, they mean leading the the news for the night. Yeah, no, that makes sense. I'd be interested in actually seeing data. I'm, I'm I, sorry, I used to be a project manager, a data analyst. I'd be interested in seeing newspaper sales sort of like before and after um, some of the so-called, you know, crimes of the century, just right. to see, uh, yeah, just to see how the numbers are affected. It'd be interesting. Right. Uh, 1989 and in New York Magazine. Okay. I'm surprised it wasn't earlier than that. But sorry, they came up with it, or was it a movie? It apparently appeared, the phrase, it, if it bleeds, it leads, appeared in that context in 1989 in a uh, New York Magazine essay. Well, someone was very clever that day, weren't they? Yes, they were. I, like I said, I'm honestly surprised it's not a bit older. I am, too. I bet the person who came up with that probably would have got rid of all those handkerchiefs. <laughs> probably. Yeah. Grins, and the, gore, and, the, and, and the piece of railroad, whatever. <laughs> yeah. The article was titled Grins, Gore, and Videotape, The Trouble with Local TV News by journalist Eric Pooley, P-O-O-L-E-Y. That's interesting. He was angry about the quality of the stories being published locally and the sheer volume of stories whose subject matter was grim and menacing. If it uh, leads, uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, the yeah, sentence, yeah, yeah. the thoughtful report is buried because sensational stories must launch the broadcast. If it bleeds, it leads. Well, <laughs> uh, you know, we can, that's, that's, a, that's a whole nother show. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think we yeah. I think we done uh Miss Pearl proud tonight. Told her I, so. I hope so. Um, and now I've got Don Henley's dirty laundry stuck in my head. <laughs> I don't even want to know how that got there. That's just weird. No, I'm I make my living off the evening news. Oh, oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, okay. Oh, great. Right. Now everybody has it going through their head. Thank you very much. <laughs> Way to go, Wes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Say goodnight, everybody. Good night, everybody. Thanks again, Kelly. No problem. I love being here. You're going to be on next week with Shower Jeff.